Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third session of the uh, afternoon, night, morning, depending on your time zone, but the last section of our main 2020 event. And uh, in this uh, new educational session, we're very uh, happy to welcome Dr. Jessica Thompson, who just defended her PhD at University of Montreal, uh, with Mark Schuvisner um, and uh, Joshua Benjo uh, at, the, at the Mila. Uh, her research interests lie really at the intersection of neuroscience, deep learning, and the philosophy of explanation. She's interested in how neuroscience-inspired um, in analysis method can help to explain and describe the function of deep learning system, and also how machine learning theory can impact our understanding of biologically intelligent systems. So it's the second year that in a row that Jessica very kindly agreed to cover this material for us. There's lots of paper right now that compare the activity of artificial neural networks with biological neural network. And the real big question is like, how do you do that? But more fundamentally, what can you gain? What can you learn from those kinds of experiments? And right now, at this moment, uh, Jessica is probably the person I know who has the most interesting things to say about uh, those questions. So I am uh, delighted that she's agreed once again to join us on short notice. So Jessica, the floor is yours. OK, thank you so much. Um, OK, so. Let's just dive in. The, uh, the experimental setting that I'll be focusing on is the following. So let's say you have an animal engaged in a task, say labeling objects in images. And let's say you have an artificial neural network that's doing the same thing. Just as we can peer inside the animal's brain to see how its neurons respond to each image, we can also look at the patterns of activation evoked in the artificial neural network. To be clear, um, if we're using artificial neurons that look like this, then when I refer to activations, I'm referring to the output of the nonlinear activation function applied to the weighted sum of the input to that unit. And there's accumulating evidence that representations that are learned in these deep networks trained on machine learning tasks have something in common with biological neural activity throughout the primate visual ventral stream and potentially other sensory systems and other species as well. This type of analysis has provided evidence of a shared representation representational hierarchy, where early sensory regions are found to be most similar to shallower layers of the network, and deeper or later regions are more similar to deeper layers. So what I'd like to do with this tutorial is give you an overview of the different analysis methods that are used in such comparisons, and along the way, touch on some of the issues that arise when we are interpreting these kinds of results. Um, and very briefly at the end, we'll talk a little bit about uh, common goals in neuroscience and AI and how this type of work might fit into those, uh, uh, you know, accomplishing those goals. Um, so let's start talking about methods to calculate the similarity between two neural activation patterns. Let's say this is our neural network. Turn on my laser pointer. Let's say this is our neural network and it's receiving these images as input. So for every image x1, x2, x3, we'll have activations z1, z2, z3 at each unit in the network. So this means that we have a vector of activations for each unit. Those vectors of activation will become the columns of a matrix like this, where the rows correspond to the experimental conditions or the stimuli, and the columns to the units or neurons or voxels or whatever your measurement channels are. And in the setting I described on the first slide, we would end up with two of these matrices, one containing measurements from the brain and one containing the artificial neural activations. And uh, the experimental conditions here will be matched. So both of these matrices will have the same number of rows corresponding to the same conditions or stimuli in the same order. 
but for most of these methods, um, the measurement channels do not need to be matched. So you can have a different number of columns. Uh, these matrices could also both come from artificial systems or they could both come from two, two brain regions or two subjects. So the, the same methods can be used to compare two brain regions or two layers of a network. But for now, let's stick to the setting where we have one set of observations from the brain and another from a model. One of the most common approaches is to use regularized linear regression. Some of you will be familiar with encoding analysis where candidate computational models, which are a function of the stimuli, are um, compared on how well they can predict brain activity. These models might be constructed to test specific hypotheses about neural representations. The top panel here depicts the training phase where the parameters of our linear regression model are fit. And then the bottom panel shows the testing phase where the trained model, our, our learned weights here, are going to be used to predict brain responses to a set of held out stimuli. And then the performance of the, the model is quantified by comparing the true brain activity to the predicted brain activity. And um, when we replace these hand-designed models with deep neural networks, this allows us to ask different types of scientific questions about what procedures yield brain-like representations. So what model architectures, what training recipes, tasks, data sets, et cetera, result in brain-like activation patterns. And the deep networks themselves can also serve as a synthetic test bed to test and generate hypotheses about neural computation. This linear regression approach is uh, usually used in the work of Jim DiCarlo, Dan Yeamans, and their academic descendants. So in, in this setup, the activity in each layer of a deep network is used to predict neural activity from each ROI along the primate visual ventral pathway. Jim DiCarlo has described his scientific approach as trying to turn a scientific problem into an engineering one. And this approach can be summarized as predict, then simplify. So first focus on building models that are as descriptive as possible, and then probe and simplify the models to understand why they are predictive. But there are some caveats to keep in mind when interpreting the results of such analyses. The most straightforward kind of claim we might want to make based on such an analysis is something like, the representations learned in the model allow us to make accurate predictions of brain activity in some region of interest. This implies that we've learned something generalizable about the relationship between the model and the brain. The ability to predict will be especially important in instances where we want to exert control. For example, in the talk by Puya Vashavan yesterday. We might also be tempted to say that the model explains some neural activity or neural function. And here it will be important to be clear about um, what we actually mean by explain in this context. In regression, there is a notion of variance explain or R squared value, which tells us how much of the variance in our target variable is captured by the model. This statistical quality is what we are referring to when we say that a model explains some brain activity. This statistical explanation is not the same as scientific explanation. So for example, there may be many models that capture the variance in your data equally well. The broader scientific goal to discover explanations for some cognitive capacity like object recognition will involve integrating many sources of evidence, not just the results from a single analysis. Um, and lastly, there are several studies who will claim that because we can predict Y from X, that um, X is similar to Y. Uh, 
Um, so because, because we've used linear regression, we can say that there is a relatively simple linear relationship between these two representations. If we were using nonlinear regression methods instead, we might be less inclined just to say that the representations are similar because there'd be a more complicated function relating them. But an important aspect here is that predictive accuracy is not symmetric. So just because you can predict X from Y doesn't mean that you can predict Y from X. This means that predictive accuracy as commonly used in this literature does not provide a distance between two representations. We can imagine ways of making it a distance. So for instance, by just taking the average of um, the two accuracies of Y predicting X and X predicting Y. But this is not typically done in the literature. Instead, researchers focus on predicting brain activity, not predicting the activations in the model. Um, so if you like linear regression, but you really want a symmetric similarity value, you might be interested in canonical correlation analysis. In linear regression, we just learn one linear transformation between X and Y. But in canonical correlation analysis, we learn two. One from X to its canonical variables and another from Y to its own canonical variables. And the, uh, this, this CCA, canonical correlation analysis learns linear transformations of both X and Y to maximize the alignment of these canonical variables. So for example, let's imagine this is your X data. So you have some representational space defined by your measurement channels, which could be voxels in this case. Um, and you've observed several experimental conditions or stimuli, which are points in this space. And let's say this is your Y data, which looks pretty similar to your X data if you could only turn it upside down and stretch it a little bit. So CCA will learn to squish X and to turn Y upside down such that the canonical variables X star and Y star are maximally aligned. And these R values, these canonical correlations between the canonical uh, variables summarizes how well aligned um, these canonical variables are. And if you average these, this gives you a symmetric similarity metric. Um, several CCA variants have been used in machine learning to study deep neural network representations. For example, in this case, to study the learning dynamics by comparing a trained network to itself at different points throughout training to see how, how do the representations change over the course of training. Or to compare different architectures trained on the same task in this case, comparing a convolutional neural network to a ResNet. But there are some limitations of CCA. One of those limitations is described in this paper by Simon Kornblith and colleagues. This was one of my favorite papers from last year, so I highly recommend it. The authors ask, essentially, what do we want from a similarity metric? and then they analyze um, several different metrics to understand their properties. As a qualitative starting point for what we want from a similarity metric, they propose that if we have two neural networks of identical architecture and trained on the same data, only differing in their random initialization, that corresponding layers should be most similar between these two networks. So the first layer should be most similar, the first layer in one network should be most similar to the first layer in the other, um, and so on. And they found that only centered kernel alignment, a method that they propose in this paper, does a good job at this task. Simple CCA does very poorly, um, and linear regression is actually the next best performing model, but um, still performs much worse than CKA.
So in these figures, what we're looking for is this diagonal uh, pattern where corresponding layers in these two networks are most similar to each other. And we see that for CKA, but not for any of the CCA variants or uh, for linear regression. So I think that this result is actually really important for neuroscience analysis because we are often trying to make these claims of a shared representational hierarchy. But if linear regression can't even show that corresponding layers of two identical networks are similar, how can we trust it to show that a biological sensory pathway maps onto a neural network model? Um, so we can try to, in the paper, they try to explain why CKA is able to perform this task better than other metrics. Um, and they look at the invariance properties of these metrics. So something like CCA, so most of these variants are um, invariant to any invertible linear transform applied to either X or Y. Um, and also any isotropic scaling of the data. CKA, on the other hand, is only invariant to orthogonal transforms, things like rotations and reflections. Um, and this might explain why it is able to identify corresponding layers better than other metrics. But one of the take home messages here should be that there is no obvious right answer to what it means quantitatively for two representations to be similar. Translating our qualitative notions of similarity into quantitative metrics involves thinking about what we want to be invariant to and what we want to be sensitive to. Um, centered kernel alignment when used with a linear kernel is very similar to representational similarity analysis or RSA, which is commonly used in neuroscience to compare models or different uh, measurement modalities. The first step in representational similarity analysis is to calculate the uh, dissimilarity matrix for each brain region or model that you want to compare. So in this example from the original um, RSA paper, our, exp our experimental conditions are faces and houses, and for each pair of stimuli, we're going to calculate the dissimilarity between the patterns of activity evoked by those two stimuli. These dissimilarity matrices provide a convenient summary of the representational geometry of a brain region or model. Because these matrices will all be the same size, the size is determined by the experimental conditions, we can compare them easily even if the original data were at very different spatial or temporal scales. RSA will often use some form of a correlation-based similarity at both of these steps, whereas centered kernel alignment, on the other hand, uses the dot product similarity at both steps. So that's one difference between RSA and CKA. One consequence of using correlation or cosine-based distance estimates in RSA is that the similarity is not invariant to rotations, as is the case for CKA. So in this example, again, we have a space defined by some um, artificial units or neurons. Um, and we have observed several stimuli which correspond to these data points. The middle panel highlights two points in space. The Euclidean distance corresponds to just drawing a straight line between these two points. Correlation or cosine-based distant metrics will be a function of the angle between the vectors defined by these points. When we rotate this activation space in the third panel, the Euclidean distance is unaffected. It's the same, the distance between these two points, the Euclidean distance between these two points is the same, but the angle between the vectors has changed, which means that any metric that depends on 
the angle between these vectors, like correlation or cosine based distance will not be invariant to rotations. So do we want to be invariant to rotations or not? The CKA paper suggested yes, uh, but it might depend on the context. So let's, as an example, talk about uh, permutation, which is a, a type of rotation. You can implement a permutation with a rotation. So let's say we're analyzing this neural network here. And let's focus just on this second layer. We have three units, one that responds to this green to purple gradient, one to horizontal lines, and one to vertical lines. What if we permute these units such that they have the same response properties but in a different order? Are these two representations the same? In artificial neural networks, there is no meaning to the order of the units in a layer. So as long as the weights at the following layer are also switched appropriately, then this permutation will have no effect on the function of the network. Therefore, I conclude that these two representations are the same thing, that they're, these aren't meaningfully different. Um, and so, if I'm trying to calculate a similarity between them, I want them to be maximally similar. I want my similarity metric to be invariant to permutation. However, in neuroscience, the spatial organization of voxels or neurons often does have meaning. So if we swapped primary auditory cortex with primary visual cortex, that would definitely be a meaningful permutation. However, within a single brain region, we may or may not care so much about the spatial organization. We may care more about the, um, some geometric properties of the representation. Um, yeah, so that concludes sort of the overview of the methods. And um, for the remaining time, I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, responses to this kind of research and um, some of the meta-scientific questions that, that come up. So this, this type of research that I've been talking about comparing artificial intelligence models to biological brains can be considered one arm of a deep learning approach to neuroscience. And there's been a lot of criticism and debate surrounding this approach. People might say things like deep neural networks are uninterpretable and therefore can't help us understand the brain, or that we've just replaced one black box with another. Advocates of the approach like to respond with like this Richard Feynman quote saying that what I cannot create, I do not understand, or citing the fact that deep neural networks are inspired by the brain. Um, so, yeah, what, it, what are the, is there a common goal that, that these two fields um, are working towards? And if so, you know, how does this um, research on comparing um, activations contribute? Um, so at the first Cognitive Computational Neuroscience Conference in 2017, Jim DiCarlo moderated this panel session on explaining cognition brain computation and intelligent behavior. He posed the question, what is your definition of success? Meaning, what is the scientific goal you are working towards? Um, yeah, what is the scientific goal that you are working towards? And I find the answers from the panelists very insightful. So I'll, um, I'll let you listen to uh, Jim DiCarlo pose the question. And then for the sake of time, I'll paraphrase some of the answers um, and then I'll, I'll let, let you listen to some of them. So I think if I unplug 
Okay, so I think those last two comments were a good setup to kind of one of the maybe provocative questions I wanted to ask, and maybe this just blows up the whole meeting, but the, the whole point, when people say they want to work together, and that was part of Nico introduced us, we need to bring these things together, perhaps can we? Usually there's some idea of a shared goal, I would have thought. And, um, you know, so I want to, and, and what success would even look like. So I, I don't know if you went around this table how much agreement there would be on what success looks like. And, you know, thinking from an engineering perspective, if one group decides we're going to go to Mars and that's our mission, another group says we're going to dig a hole to the plant center of the Earth, those groups don't necessarily have to talk to each other. So when I hear you talking about insects and language, and Nancy talking about language, it's not quite that bad. But um, I, I want to hear your, your thoughts in, 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 on those kind of questions. Are we even after the same thing here? And, um, and and uh, especially from uh, uh, Jan and the machine learning side where people say, well, we don't care about the brain at all. Uh, we just want to do some engineering. So that's a totally different thing. So so if, if any of you want to comment on that, um, that's a, one of my fire bombs here. Yeah. So hopefully you were able to hear that. Um, and hopefully you can still hear me. Um, answer and just paraphrase it for you because it's quite long but basically he says that the common goal is to explain intelligence which for him means something like coming up with the laws of physics for intelligence and these fundamental laws are going to abstract away from uh, irrelevant details but we don't know yet which elements are relevant so to him, just because something is present in biological brains doesn't mean that it's going to feature in an explanation of intelligence. Um, and then the next uh, person who answers is Jackie Gottlieb. Um, and her answer is really on the other side. She's coming from neuroscience uh, and she says, neuroscience is about making reliable, reproducible, robust characterizations of neural systems that we we have these characterizations to some extent for some systems but that we're still missing this for large swaths of the brain so her definition of success is to come up with these robust reproduce, reproducible characterizations uh, for the whole for the whole brain and ai and machine learning might provide tools that are useful but but she can take them or leave them they're not an integral part of her research so you know, up to now we have these two answers that are basically like, I'm gonna do my thing and I'm gonna do my thing. And, you know, we don't need to talk to each other necessarily. And then I'm gonna skip ahead to um, Josh Tenenbaum's answer. Um, yeah, I, I would just say I think it's important to distinguish between short term or near term notions of success and longer term ones. Right. And I mean, many different time scales. Um, I think long term, maybe not all of us are interested in this, but I think all of us, um, me and Jan, and I think everybody here, I think what you, why would you come to this conference unless you didn't share some version of a long term common vision of success, which is to understand human intelligence because we're humans and we want to understand our own minds. Although I'm also very fascinated by insects, but I mean, I think we're mostly here. It's not just clinical applications. We're here because we want to understand how we work and who we are really. Okay. And, and what that understanding means is, is long-term stable, reproducible, all that stuff but it means you know it means some kind of engineering like description that's what the computational means that we can all agree on that you know produces behavior but also you know cognitive science isn't just about behavior it's about cognition it's about the computations characterized at something like a mathematical or software level but also what neuroscience is about i would say the computations at the brain or hard or hardware levels or all the circuit levels you know there's not just two levels but ultimately it's bridging up all of these things that we'd like to understand we'd like to have an engineering synthetic description that we could build in a machine that convinces us that we actually understand in all the different ways we mean how our minds work. At the same time, that we have to just recognize this is incredibly hard. We may not achieve anything like that, you know, in the time of a PhD or a career or a lifetime, of course. So, you know, I think what distinguishes the different approaches is where are you most comfortable starting and what, what do you see as like, 
you know, the, the, the first thing you can get to, which then if you can get to that, then you feel like you have something to build on and take you to the next step. So that's why in my talk at the beginning, I tried to characterize the different approaches as like different starting points and different trajectories, top down, bottom up, middle out, both top down and bottom up and so on. And I think, you know, again, it's, it's to take the analogy, are we trying to go to Mars or go to the center of the earth or whatever? It might be like, you know, if, we're, if you're trying to achieve some great construction project, maybe it is to go to the center of the earth or dig a tunnel into the Alps or whatever. You know, you might have to start from from France or Italy or maybe dig down, you know, you might have to, there might, like, we don't know which is the right approach. And I think this is, you know, um, this is the sort of thing where, uh, People, having people which, who have different ideas of where they feel comfortable and understand starting with and trajectories that seem meaningful, surely we can have something to talk, talk about. It's just you have, we have, you have to understand that in the short term, what's going to count as success, what's going to count as like progress really, might look very different. Um, and trying to build common languages for understanding what our each different notions of progress are will help us actually build the long-term bridges that we need. I, just, I, I sort of said this before, but I think it's sort of an answer to your question. A sh a, an example of short-term success, in my view, is the work on the face system by Tsao and Freiwald and others, right? I mean, so they have, you know, I identified a system that's characterized in, in quite spectacular neural detail with a lot of information about the nature of the representations at multiple stages in a hierarchy, which can be modeled and are being modeled to some extent with deep nets, which... Uh, you know, fit some of the behavior from humans, which are probably homologous to the human system. And, you know, it's that enterprise is not done, but it's it's pretty spectacular. So if you allow yourself to say, okay, let's not try to whole, understand the whole thing at once. God help us do that. Let's take a piece. Here's a natural kind. It's a piece. And I think that there's huge progress on that piece. So that's a kind of success. So... Uh, I really love these last two answers from Josh Tenenbaum and Nancy Kanwisher. Um, and I think that it's a good guiding, these are good guiding kind of principles for how to think about this research, that there are going to be many different short-term goals that might seem quite distinct and like there's no overlap, um, but that it's really these long-term goals that we don't know how to reach yet. We don't know you know, we don't have the perfect approach um, where where these goals converge. And and I think Nancy Kenwisher's point that um, you know, some of this work in the on the face system where we have kind of that that reproducible, reliable characterization of the nature of these representations, and we we're beginning to to map these onto deep neural networks. Um, which help us to account for not just the, the neural activity, but the behavior um, is, is a good example of, of success. Um, so yeah, continuing on this idea from, from Josh Tenenbaum of we need, uh, you know, we need to come from, if you wanna go under the Alps, we need to, someone has to start in France, someone start in Italy. Um, I, I like to cite this, this paper, this meta science paper from Berna de Beezer and, and colleagues, where they showed that in a simulation of scientific discovery in a model centric framework, that both innovative research speeds up the discovery of scientific truth by facilitating the exploration of model space, and also that epistemic diversity, so taking all of these different approaches, these different ways of knowing optimizes across desirable properties of scientific discovery. So to conclude, I'll just leave with some takeaways before um, questions. Uh, what does it mean for two representations to be similar? This is, um, uh, we don't have a clear answer to this question. It depends on the context. So we can translate our qualitative notion, notions of similarity into quantitative metrics by considering what we want to be invariant or sensitive to in a particular context. Um, explaining variance in our data sets is not the same thing as developing scientific explanations of our phenomena of interest. So I think it's important to recognize that um, that you know, explaining variance in a data set is one of those those short term goals, and the the long term goals are the scientific explanations. Um, so yeah, like I said before, many research programs in neuroAI will have divergent short term goals, but common long term goals, and um, 
discovering models that are highly predictive of brain activity is the beginning, not the end of a research trajectory. And lastly, that epistemic, epistemic diversity optimizes scientific discovery. So let's let's embrace that, um, and it's let's remember that it's not about what's the what's the best approach, but what are the best set of approaches to explore. So with that, um, I'll conclude. Thank you for your attention, and I can take any questions. Thanks so much, Jessica. Uh for the lovely, lovely uh, talk. And um, we've got a couple of questions in the in the chat. So um, uh, generally people have voted as a clear winner. In this case, they are tight, <laughs> but we're still going to take them in the order. So the first one is, we are not able to separate excitatory and inhibitory contributions to coding, particularly in recurrent interactions in most imaging methods. Deep learning models use only excitatory connections. How do we reconcile that? Um, yeah, great question. I think that there, I mean, I'm not an expert in this by, by any means, but I believe that there are some people working on um, incorporating um, Um, more more biologically realistic types of excitatory and inhibitory connections in artificial neural networks to see, um, you know, how does that impact? Um, in in this case, I would say that um, there are there's a long list of differences between the networks that we use in mm -hmm. machine learning and and true brains. Um, and I'm not so interested actually in like this long list of differences. I'm more interested in the similarities. Um, and um, you know, it's, I think it's very valuable to, to try to understand the, the role of the pieces that are, that are missing. Um, but I don't think it's essential for these models to be useful. Um, so, so, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think this is a great response. Da Daniel Finol in the in the chat remark. You know, in artificial neural nets, we have negative weights, but I think you're you're making a great point, uh, Jessica. That I mean, those artificial neural nets are not really proxy of what neurons are, <laughs> and you know, so mm -hmm. the convergence is is necessarily at a fairly abstract level because you know, deep learning models don't don't use realistic neural networks uh, to start with. Uh, so, question number two, to what extent those methods can capture nonlinear dynamic codes, i.e. for codes that doesn't map of, on power or activity? And that question is from Guillaume Dumas, who does MEG. So I think it's got, like, you need to understand power and activity in that context, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, Guillaume. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, yeah, so, you know, nothing that I showed today is really about dynamics or, um, yeah, information that's being encoded in time. Um, so, yeah, we'll need another presentation, I think, for, um, to talk about time. Um, so there are, so for instance, you might be familiar with uh, David Cicillo, uh has a couple of papers from... Uh, like Europe's last year, where they um, kind of propose alternative methods for for looking at um, um, uh, patterns of activation in recurrent neural networks, where they they really do dynamical um, systems type analysis. So I think that's where I would that's where I would look if I wanted to come up with a better answer to your question. Thanks a lot. And maybe for our viewers who are not that familiar with NeurSense and NeurSense methods in particular, uh, techniques such as MEG expose some very fast rhythm in brain activity. And some people believe those rhythm uh, encode critical aspects of information processing. <laughs> and that's not necessarily something that is being, you know, described and discussed in the deep learning models we've covered so far in the, in the tutorial. So, I mean, I'm just rephrasing uh, with a bit more background. Uh, and last question that we've got so far, 
is can you elaborate on how AI vision compares to different species, especially insects visual system? So a very specific question. Can you tell us more about the insect visual system, Jessica? <laughs> um, I'm not sure I can do that, but I, I can say something else. So for instance, um, uh, so, if, so most of this work that I presented kind of focuses on primate visual system, you know, human and non-human primates. If there's some paper, so um, I think it's Santiago Cadena has a paper looking at the mouse visual system. And it found actually that um, a random network was just as good at predicting activity in that visual system compared to the, the neural network. Um, so it could be that the kind of object recognition, objective function that these networks are trained on correspond more closely to primate vision than, than other species, especially other species that don't rely on vision in the same way. Uh, I see a panda. Um, so yeah, if you're if you're working on if you're an animal that cares really about scent and odor, your visual representations are probably completely different, and you would need a different objective function to really capture what's going on there. So I'd say insects are going to need a different objective function. Once again, awesome answers, and I I mean I love the idea of in relating to different you know, biological species, and maybe we could also have different uh, artificial species we could categorize in the future and, and do a whole zoo of, of different, you know, networks. Um, it, just to mention in, in the in the uh, question tab, there's also a, a, a pointer by Elizabeth Dupre on how the mantis shrimp integrates color over time, which uh, I, I do not know this work but it's super interesting so i encourage you to look at this at this uh, link as well so i think that is all and uh please join me uh, to thank again uh, jessica thompson for the wonderful uh, wonderful lecture bye everyone